Hello, welcome to uh, another episode of the Art Practical Workshop series. My name is Nico Tripsevich. In this episode, we're going to uh, geo-reference a Sanborn historical fire insurance map and then uh, connect it to census data in the recently released 1950 census. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I have um, begun a project here in QGIS where I'm um, going to georeference these Sanborn maps. And I started to create a geo package um, polygon layer here. And I'm going to leave it in the EPSG 4326. Um, actually, let's use pseudo Mercator 3857, which is the reference system of of these uh, web-based satellite imagery services. And I created a series of fields here. As you can see, street name, street address, house ID, which is gonna be a combination of street name and street address, a unique ID for the house. And first name, last name, gender, race, occupation, born. So these are basically mirroring the, the fields that are found in the 1950 census. Um, I'm just reproducing these and you know, typing them in here. Um, occupation group. And you can add, you simply add them like that and you get another field. So I've, I've created these fields and <clears throat> let's go ahead and create that. And now we have this um, polygon layer. And I'm going to show you how I do reference these from Sanborn. So now the Sanborn maps prior to 1925 or so are available on the Library of Congress in full color. These are fire insurance maps. Um, so the, <clears throat> the best way to find your study area is to use this index map, which occurs at the beginning of each group at the Library of Congress. And uh, you find each block has a number and then there's a tract or region that has a bolder number. So I would you know, first find your, I believe this is the, the map sheet, the page number in the map sheet, and then in bold there, see? Uh, and then you would find the actual block, city block in smaller number. And I've gone ahead and found it already to save time. Here we are in, this is the Peralta Hacienda area, Peralta Creek. And these, these houses are, have been removed to create a park, but they still exist here on the Sanborn maps from 1928. So I'll go ahead and digitize the footprints off of these, and then we can connect them to the census data from that area. These houses were removed in the 1980s. So the first thing I'll do is um, clip out the this segment of houses. One thing I would note is that uh, you can see a curve here in the line. So there's some distortion introduced by the scanning process. These parcel lines are sometimes available from the county, and one could georeference to the county parcel lines. However, Sanborn, uh, well, first of all, you may have error in the parcel lines in the projection um, as compared with the satellite imagery that's fairly high resolution. And uh, I've, I've noticed that here in Alameda County. And also when you're using a historical map source like this, consider the intent or the focus of the map maker. And in this case, it's the homes. So, the parcel lines are somewhat secondary. I would be cautious about using the parcel lines as um, a referencing layer. Finally, it's recommended that you not include non, uh, like non-priority data in your referencing. So for example, I wouldn't georeference this entire area in one go. I would reference this area, like the city blocks. If we were focused on here, I would reference this area as a single unit and this area as a separate unit because sometimes how streets are compressed in order to squeeze 
blocks onto a single map sheet in Sanborn. So the street may not be faithfully represented in terms of its width. Uh, so if you include the street in your referencing, you may introduce error. So here we have this area that we're interested in. We could be zoomed quite far out. And again, I'm gonna skip this street, right? I'm gonna reference these houses in one go using the clip tool. And we can clip it. I would include the street names, this sort of ancillary stuff, and maybe the opposite corner, but it's okay to include this extra information on the edges, just don't use it to reference. So then I'm gonna click the clip image. There it is. And look, I can actually see how it's barely legible. If I increase the image size, it actually goes to the original. And now we have a really high res image and I can download this image. I click that and I'm gonna right click on Windows here and save it. I'll just call it Sanborn 1928. I would name it more um, specifically for my project. If I, I might call it uh, the street name and a uh, range of addresses shown. So the next step is to georeference the Sanborn maps using either the county parcel boundary map or the, uh, the imagery, uh, imagery services, such as here, I've got quick map services loaded with high resolution imagery. Um, as I mentioned, the parcel maps are a possibility because they appear on Sanborns. However, um, sometimes the parcels are not very, accurately shown on the Sanborns, and the parcels from the county may not do reference neatly either. So for example, here I've added the Alameda County parcel layer. I can show you how that was added um, using this ArcGIS REST server layer. And if we look here, it's Alameda County parcels. Here's the address, and please note, I click this when I created that layer, only request overlapping, features overlapping the current view extent. So I zoomed back and I had that box checked and the result is this orange layer. And it notice how it ends here because it, I wasn't zoomed out that far. And if you don't check that box, it can take a long time to load because it's the entire county. But the other issue is look how it doesn't line up very well with the imagery behind. Um, Based on some testing, I've determined the imagery is much closer than the county parcel boundaries. So I won't be using that, but I wanted to show you that that is a possible option since they do appear on Sanborn. And it would be really nice to just click on these um, with the snapping turned on. You could conceivably just click right on those corners. Um, so we will be using this imagery and we'll be um, georeferencing using the georeferencer tool that in this is a QGIS version 3.26 and it is moved now to the layer menu from the raster menu and I downloaded a Sanborn the one slightly west of what I was showing you earlier I think will make a better candidate for this example so I'm bringing it in that block here is this block in south so I'll be bringing that in <clears throat> using this imagery. And so one question is, which of these houses are still there? For example, this area has been, these buildings were removed in the expansion of the park. And these buildings look much bigger than the houses uh, shown on the Sanborn. However, these little four houses do appear. Another trick is to go to, um, Google Street Maps, and here we are in the, in the park, and we could just kind of look around and look at the structures. And you can see here are those four houses, and they, they have the appearance of houses built in the 1920s, as does this one, but these look newer. So these are those large houses we can see in the imagery that are probably built in the 50s or 60s. Um, I also I, uh, quickly showed you this tab. This is where I got that services layer that, that I showed you um, for parcel boundaries. So let's use the, um, the services layer shown 
let's not use the services layer. Let's use the um, imagery layer that I showed you. And I checked Street View and I determined that those little four houses are in fact the same houses. So I'll go ahead and start georeferencing. I'm just gonna do a quick job here so that there isn't uh, too much time spent on this. The basic idea is that we are going to put some points around the map that correspond and keep in mind these houses have eaves generally. So I would move in a little ways from the very corner. We're assuming that the Sanborn doesn't include the eaves. So let's just come in a little bit from the edge there. Um, sometimes you can find roof examples that don't have the eaves, that, that have small eaves. Yeah, scroll here. So I'm going to put two points up there, perhaps a point in the middle. Let's see, this, this house looks like it was here. Um, Let's count houses. One, two, three, four, five, six. We are one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's this house. This is this last house here? And then everything south of that was replaced. And there have been some changes in the designs. You can see uh, many of these houses were expanded. So it's probably best to find a house that looks like it hasn't been expanded and find a original corner. Let's go ahead and maybe drop a point. Uh, I'll put a point right here. And right here. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Ah. That was the wrong spot. Well, it'll demonstrate how to move point. You just use this. And that was this structure here. You can adjust to replacement with that tool. Okay. Continuing, um, these were removed in here. But this house, I know from personal experience is a, one of the older houses in the area. So I'm going to use that one as a, as a georeferencing point. Now this corner is covered in a tree, but this corner is pretty visible. There's the deck. It has large eaves, as I recall. You can check street view if we needed to. So this one, I'll just go ahead and move this. There's a new point here. And then a point here, tracking the eave. All right. And then this structure is the original Peralta Hacienda. I know that that's original. Now, this Paxton Street was closed when they created the park. And there it is. Also, um, yeah, so here's the Peralta House with very large eaves. This deck is a good candidate. Although the corner looks a little different. Tricky. Um, so we use the southern end here, as you can see it pretty well. But there seems to be a, a little offset there. So maybe I'll use the northern one because there's a glitch in the sandborn there. I'll use this corner. Okay. Okay, so we've got four, five points here now. That's probably enough. Note that this Sanborn goes further south, but our focus is on this area. So you should concentrate your ground control points in the area distributed around the area of interest and not try to do the entire original map in fact, it probably would have been better to clip the, when I was downloading this, it probably would have been better to clip it here and not attempt to download all of it because it implies that this is all georeferenced. And while it'll probably be reasonably 
well-referenced um, focuses in this area. So let's go ahead and check the parameters. We're going to do a polynomial one. We're going into the Web Mercator coordinate reference system. I'm going to shorten this. We don't want too long file names. And let's just check where it's been saved. We'll go into the field school folder. And I'm going to use uncheck these. If you have a black collar around your original, it's a good idea to use zero for transparency to remove that collar, although you can do it at a later step as well. I always save the ground control points. It saves them out into a little text file and you can, um, they, they travel with the TIFF that you're saving out and you can load them and make adjustments like I did earlier here if you find that some of your residuals aren't very good. Before clicking the start georeferencing, I'm going to sort by the residuals column and look for the biggest error. Let's see which one that is. That's number three. So one thing you can do is sort of an iterative process. You can select it, find it. It's going to be number three would be this one. You can turn it on and off. Oh, it's this one. And you can adjust it if, if you think it if you, you can do a better job, you might consider sorting by residual and actually right click and removing or adjusting with this tool, this tool, the, uh, the, the worst residual. So like you can uncheck it and see how it quickly adjusts a, a formula. It, it comes up with a, a correction georeferencing solution without using that ID number three. So it's a compromise between all the enabled ground control points. All right, let's just go ahead and use this one. And there it is. Now we did get the black collar because I didn't specify. We can change it and add the zero transparency and rerun it. Um, and I'll probably have to remove it here so it doesn't have a conflict overriding. There, and you can see by checking that box, we no longer have that black collar. So that's a good idea. The trade-off is you look, look at all the, the black pixels, for example, here are now transparent. So it's really a trade-off. You get this sort of funny shimmery look on the black pixels when you, when you make them transparent. All right, so this is now, this step is now complete. Now you can go ahead and georeference. I'm just gonna do one house in this case you can see that this one, um, 25, 11, is now this park. Let's go ahead and georeference it. I'll use this layer. Maybe I'll, I'm going to change the appearance. Well, first I'm going to call it something different. I'll call it um, Sanborn Houses. and make the symbology transparent. Something kind of visible. And I'll just go ahead and start georeferencing. You decide how much detail to put in it. Referencing. And now you can see all those fields from the census that I created earlier are now visible. We know the street is 34th, 34th Ave, and the street address is 2511. There's a garage as well, which may be very interesting for archaeologists, where the outbuildings are. Sometimes the privies are visible in these maps. All right, so let's go ahead and save those edits. And we can turn off Sanborn. We have that structure. Now you can see today it's a park, and this is sort of a pavilion space associated with the park. Now, continuing with the 
census here. Um, the 1950 census was recently released because it has been 72 years. And they are available open access here at the archives.gov. One uh, issue with using these is that you need to know the, it's a big help to know the enumeration district of the census that you're working in. Uh, another option for many people have access to the university libraries to Ancestry Library. And the, the Ancestry Library, the, one of the biggest advantages I found to using these is that they do have this Explore Maps tool. So you click that and it will take you to, they've actually digitized and georeferenced the original enumeration district map. You can see in orange back there. And if you, so you can basically do a spatial search instead of having to know numerically that this is 67 152. There's the, there's the creek, there's the current park. You can just click it, drop a place mark like that, and then here you go. Boom, and it takes you to the census of 1915. And then you page through here, and I've already found, I paged through and I found that um, some pages into it. Here is 34th Street, number 2511, and it's Mike. Landowski, Landucci, head of household, white male, 50 years old, born in Italy, and tells you about his employment. Looks like he's a grocery store employee, proprietor. So I'll go ahead and, and type that in. It's editable. So now one thing you might consider is giving individual house IDs to the to the structures. If you're really paying attention to your structures and, and different sources of data, it, it might make sense to come up with your own ID numbers for each of these houses that may differ from 25 from the street address like 2511 because these um like, for example, this house is no longer standing. So you, you can have your own archaeological reference. So now, right, grocery, born, uh, see, 1950, he was 50. So let's just say he was born in 1900. There we go. And we want to perhaps label by. Last name, or you might do you could do a choropleth map showing other fields like occupation, race, age, and generalize about um, the historical character of this neighborhood. So that is the uh, example I wanted to provide incorporating Sanborn and census data into a GIS.